what should I talk about? And he just said, like, maybe the most useful thing is to talk a little bit about everything. So this is more like a <laughs> data overview. So it's not a complete story about any particular data set. So if you've got uh, any questions, then I can, I'm happy to then uh, elaborate during the coffee break about, about particular processes. Um, so first of all, um, as you can see, there's a bit long list of people who have contributed data and logistical support and knowledge and ideas. So first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, our intensive carbon plots. So uh, these are so-called gem plots. There's a nice gem website. And we follow standard protocols across the tropics. So we got similar plots in Africa and um, in Amazon and in Australia now, I think. So Yatunda is the uh, one who initially set up this whole uh, gem protocol thing. Uh, here in Borneo, we got uh, plots in Saba, which are what I call like my plots, of course. Uh, correlation with other people. So we got two plots in Danum and two plots in Maliao and then uh, five plots in the safe landscape. Then we also got two plots in Lambier Hills and those are not my plots. They are uh, by our collaborator Kuhn who is very kindly sharing data from those. But that's like that's not uh, not my data. So uh, the other plots <coughs> in SAFE and in Maliao were set up in 2011 and the Danum plots in followed in 2015 and we've been monitoring continuously since. Um, and this is, the, this is the flux tower. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but just so that you know where it is. So we got quite a lot of knowledge on the, uh, just the stand structure and biomass. So uh, in the top one, there is the uh, biomass of the uh, log plots. Uh, and they kind of uh, estimated pre-logging biomass, which is based on uh, historical data that we obtained from uh, Forest Research Center, that's in the, uh, the white bars. And then we got our overall plots in darker gray, and then the average, the last two bars. And of course, as you would expect, the biomass is considerably lower in the log plots. And this is the stand structure uh, showing by diameter class. So um, obviously, in the log plots, the largest trees are conspicuously absent. Then also, uh, because uh, the field map uh, team joined us and came and mapped all the positions of the stems, but also the, uh, the size and shapes of the crowns. So we got really good plot maps uh, for all of our plots. And uh, then this is from the uh, airborne LIDAR. So we also got the vertical structure of the forest quite well quantified. So there is really a lot of information of the stand structure. We also have uh, quite information on the species composition. So, uh, after quite a lot of effort, we now about we identified about 95% of the species uh, of the trees to species level, and uh, then, as it already been mentioned several times today, there was a very intensive trades campaign led by Sabina Both and uh, David Burslem, and they measured a whole suite of uh, of leaf trades, and they were measuring uh, in the eight plots, so they didn't go to Lambir and. Uh, um, almost 300 species, and the species cover 90% of the basal area in the plots and are 50 to 70 percent of the species within each plot. So, it's, uh, so all that information is there. Um, so I've been focusing uh, on the carbon dynamics. So this is like from my results. So this is net prime productivity and it's allocation. I think Yeats already shown this very similar as I was yet window. So third time today. Um, <laughs> productivity is quite similar in logs and log growth forest. But only if you look at the total productivity because there's a very clear allocation shift. So in locked forest, a lot more is allocated to the woody components at the expense of canopy. And this is quite important. This also has a practical implication that if you only go and measure tree diameters, you will come to a conclusion that locked forest is more productive but actually turned out not to be the case because, uh, because part of that higher woody productivity is at the expense of canopy uh, productivity so that uh, we shouldn't forget allocation and woody growth is not necessarily a good proxy for net prime productivity. Um, we've also measured autotrophic respiration and uh, those also don't differ significantly from one another, slightly lower in old crop forest, but actually the result is different, it's not significant. And <coughs> in terms of heterotrophic respiration though, locked forests have a higher rate, heterotrophic respiration rate. So this is coming both from the soil organic matter and from the coarse woody debris. And the coarse woody debris was a um, bit of kind of like a slight surprise, we didn't necessarily expect it to contribute so much to heterotrophic respiration. So it's a component that definitely should not be ignored when we are compiling a 
for its carbon budget. And then we can estimate the carbon balance by uh, subtracting heterotrophic respiration from net dry productivity. So what we can see is that the old growth uh, forests are either carbon neutral or possibly a small sink, a uh, small sink of carbon, whereas the locked forests seem to be carbon neutral or tending towards the source. And that is because of the higher heterotrophic respiration rate. And this is just the complete carbon budget in numbers, so if you wanted any particular number, we might be able to provide it with, obviously, uncertainties. Uh, so, but that was just only that, that was just spatial data, so all temporal patterns were averaged in the data uh, that I showed. But uh, in 2016, uh, we had this uh, strong El Niño drought, drought that we just heard from Radim. And this is our meteorological data from the flux lower. So we've got soil moisture, and that is the overall mean uh, throughout the time that we been collecting data, and this is air temperature. And we can see that it has been dry in other occasions as well. But what we saw in, the, uh, in early 2016 was this uh, very unusual combination of very low soil moisture combined with the very uh, high temperature. So the trees were under considerable uh, drought stress at that time. And that um, happened to coincide with our uh, intensive measurements in one of the plots, the tower plots, because we were already running a Gödling experiment there. So we had to up our measurement frequency of all the carbon cycling components. So instead of measuring like once a month or every six weeks, we were actually there like several times a month, which was quite uh, fortuitous because we could then get like, uh, we could then quantify the response to El Nino quite well. And the uh, process that uh, showed the very the clear response for sap flow. So this is an example of one stem, and, and here is soil moisture. Um, this is a parasharia, a diptrocarp species. And um, you can see that basically the, uh, the tree basically stopped functioning during the peak drought. But it didn't take a very large rainfall effect for it to start, um, to start functioning again, and actually it bounced back fairly, uh, fairly quickly. Um, so that was a, so could be very, very drastic crowd effect, but also a recovery. So this also agrees with what we just saw from the field map data that the diptrocarps do seem to be able to recover from these drought events. And these are just the, all the other carbon cycling components that we've been measuring during the uh, El Nino drought and also outside the drought. So um, I just like averaged the data from, from the non-drought periods and then just compared that to the uh, peak drought period. And what we can see in most processes, they are, most processes rates declined during the drought, but because the reduction was larger in, on, in productivity than in respiration, the system became a larger carbon source than it was before the drought, because before the drought, it was either, either neutral or small source of carbon to the atmosphere. And during the drought, it became a considerably larger source. Um, then, yeah, we got this flux tower, which has been a, it's both uh, fun because it's a very, uh, it's a very nice thing to climb and it's like it's nice, uh, nice, nice field work days. But also there's been lots of instrument <laughs> issues because because you need to have simultaneously like all those sensors working to be able to get data, but also your power system working, and always one of those things fails and then you don't then you have a data gap. But in theory, what it does, um, it sits above the canopy and measures the uh, CO2 exchange between the ecosystem and the atmosphere continuously, and we are. Uh, Average the values every 30 minutes. For every 30 minutes, I should be able to say if the forest is a sink or a source of CO2 and how big. So that's the ideal. And it's been operating since August 2012. Um, an ideal site for a frax tower is completely flat. And everybody who's been at SAFE will know that there is no such area at SAFE that would be flat. So there is this uh, hill behind the tower, which means that I need to ignore some of that data because it, um, the measurements just they don't produce good quality data. And also because we had lots of instrument breakages, then the data cover coverage is fairly poor. But, um, but we got something. And we're also running a MET station at the Flux Tower, and that's, com um, that's running from a separate power system and everything. So that data is actually fairly, fairly good. Um, but this is what we got analyzed. And actually, the time series for 2018 is actually reasonably good. I just haven't, didn't have time to run through it properly. So. Um, Couple of couple of good months when we got started, then lots of gaps mainly because of the power system was failing, and then then it's looking to be getting slightly better. So um, because atmospheric scientists use the science different from ecosystem scientists, now the science has switched. So at this slide, the positive values mean that system is being a source because the atmosphere is gaining carbon, and the ecosystem is losing. So so we got our. Uh, um, 
we got the respiration in black and uh, photosynthesis in gray and then the net ecosystem exchange in blue. So if we <coughs> zoom into the better periods from, so from late 2015 to uh, early 2017, um, we see that we captured the peak drought with some gaps. But anyway, we got, uh, uh, we got quite a few days of complete data during the peak drought. So I could do the same calculation of like what is the uh, flux during drought, drought and non-drought. And what we found disagrees with the measurements from the plot that um, but both uh, photosynthesis and respiration decreased, but because photosynthesis decreased more, the system became a larger source of CO2 to the atmosphere. And then um, we can move beyond carbon, and this is the work that PhD student Takeshi was doing, because um, we know the carbon, con uh, carbon content, but if we also, if we quantify the nutrient content from the same organs that we know the carbon content, we can actually use stoichiometry to infer things about nutrient demand. So we can think NPP as a carbon demand of the tree. So that this is how much the tree demands carbon to construct these different tissues. And if for the same tissues, we got the carbon to nutrient ratio, X being here like any nutrient, we can then calculate the demand for that nutrient. And this is what we uh, did in, this, uh, in our plot. So Takeshi came and collected lots of samples from different species and from different organs, and then used the NPP data and calculated that. So first of all, what he did, he was looking at how much the nutrients are recycled in internally through uh, reef sorption. So before the trees are fall, how much of the uh, nutrients are resorbed. And we could see that the resorption was more important in the old growth forest than it was in the locked systems. And then we can basically calculate, based on the NPP, we can calculate the demand. And I'm just showing you uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. So some of the demand is satisfied by the resorption, whereas some of the demand is actually has to be uh, satisfied by the uptake from soil. And he's done that uh, for, for all the nutrients. Then moving on, um, then we're also doing a dead wood project. So when we kind of realized that dead wood our uh, carbon fluxes are quite important part of the carbon cycle, but poorly quantified. <coughs> Rob wrote, wrote a grant and uh, got a big grant on uh, looking at dead wood production and decay. And that's what we've been doing across the safe landscape, not in the carbon plot, but safe vegetation plots. So um, we got annual dead wood surveys, and I'm not showing you any results because there's a poster out there by Ellie. And then we got the decomposition experiment going on on 20 vegetation plots, where you're using both local dead wood found in the plots that covers the species and the sizes and the decay classes that are local to each place. And then we're also using standard material, uh, which we got one pioneer species and one late successful species and termite exclusion exclusion to try to quantify uh, the decay and what which biotic and abiotic factors control it. But this one, I don't have any results yet because the blocks are still decaying and we're hoping to collect them uh, starting September. And uh, as part of this, uh, it's kind of like an offshoot from the uh, Deadwood project, uh, we just recently set up a, a woodlog experiment, and this is actually led by uh, my colleagues from FRC and Noreen and Roland. And we are looking at both how uh, these logs lose mass, but also how the timber quality deteriorates if they are left uh, in the forest lying about. And they got the first results out, so it's quite exciting. So um, basically, to summarize, we got continuous monitoring MBB by components and other carbon cycling components. We got campaign measurements of traits and LIDAR and tree architecture and soil chemistry <coughs> and so on. We got flux tower data, although it's a bit gappy, and we got the wood decomposition experiment going on. So thank you very much. <laughs>